Written in Bone, Chapter 9, Remember Me. The scientists and historians who have studied the human remains found throughout the colonial Chesapeake area have learned a great deal about these individuals. From their diet and health to their social status, many secrets once lost to time have become part of our recorded history again. One thing that no one could determine in a laboratory or an archive, however, was what the colonists had looked like when they were alive. Very few were drawn or painted in their lifetimes. Written descriptions of any but the most famous are rare. Forensic artists focus on solving the puzzle of appearance. Working with forensic anthropologists, these skilled specialists use skull analysis to create lifelike images of the dead. The key to this endeavor is the fact that many facial features of a living person are determined by bone features of the person's skull. Someone with a wide face has broad cheekbones, for example, while a bent, beak-like nose corresponds with a similarly shaped nasal bridge, the bone above the nasal hole. The first step in creating a facial reconstruction is to make an exact replica of the skull to eliminate any risk of damaging the original. Replicas can be made in several ways. For example, the skull of the teenage girl from Harley Knoll was reproduced with a computerized tomography scan, or a CT scan. This type of scan is used in the medical field to create images of tumors and other internal medical conditions. Instead of making a single image, as a regu regular x-ray machine would, a CT scanner makes many digital images called slices, which form a complete image when combined. Each slice contains hundreds of digital measurements. A computer translates these measurements into points that can be plotted on a three-dimensional or 3D grid. When all the points are plotted, a 3D image of the skull can be displayed on a computer's monitor. So here's our image to create the replica skull, HK7's real skull, this is it right here, was scanned by a CT scanner and the computer created a virtual image of the skull that was used to make the replica skull. So this is her actual skull and then this here is the CT scanner. The image created by a CT scan is digital. It exists only within the computer. For the artist to create a facial reconstruction, the image must be translated into a solid object. A technician transfers the digital data to sophisticated machinery that uses computer-guided precision tools to manufacture, manufacture a replica skull. The result accurately reflects the surface features of the original skull, including the tiniest cracks, depressions, and raised areas. Joanna Hughes, the forensic artist who created a clay reconstruction of HK7's face, began her work by placing an artificial eye in each of the replica skull's eye sockets. Noting HK7's African ancestry, Hughes selected brown eyes. Next, she consulted a chart created by anthropologists based on known measurements of facial tissue and the underlying muscles. Using this data as a guide, Hughes glued markers to the replica to represent the thickness of the living tissue and muscles a person of HK7's age, size, and ancestry would have most likely possessed. I use about 15 markers per skull. The markers are actually erasers. They're placed on specific points on the skull, explained Hughes. So forensic artist Joanne, Joanna Hughes placed markers on the replica skull to stand for the thickness of skin and facial muscles. Facial muscles. You can see here where she picked the brown eye to go into the eye socket. Hughes added oil-based clay to flesh out the features. So here is the clay added to the replica skull. Based on the size and location of the markers, Hughes added oil-based clay to the replica to form tissue and features. Oil-based clay doesn't dry. It remains soft to the touch so the artist can rework the features as needed. The hardest features to do are the ears and the eyelids, Hughes noted. Ears are very complex because there are a lot of nooks and crannies that are hard to sculpt, and eyelids are very small and thin. Owsley and Bruelheide worked closely with Hughes as she developed the reconstruction. They made suggestions and corrections based on their analysis of the skull's shape and features. Once her work was complete, the soft clay reconstruction was shipped to Studio EIS, a sculpture and design studio whose sculptors specialize in creating historically accurate sculpture. We continue the process from where the forensic artists left off, using exactly what they've given us, but in a different permanent material, explained Ivan Schwartz, the studio's founder and director. The sculptors began by creating a plaster mold of Hughes's clay sculpture. 
The wet plaster is applied directly to the oil-based clay and allowed to solidify, explained Schwartz. Because oil-based clay repels the water in plaster, the hardened plaster didn't stick to the clay. The resulting plaster mold was pulled off the sculpture and filled with water-based clay. Studio EIS sculptors then removed this clay cast from the mold and began to finalize the details of the reconstruction. The sculptors added precise features to give the reconstruction the look of a living person. By adding clay in one area and removing it from another, by looking at a living teenage girl whose bone structure resembled that of HK7, by noting the small details of, individ of individual faces, the curve of the tip of an ear or the way skin lies over a cheek or a jaw, and by keeping in mind the structural reflections Hughes had created, the sculptors meticulously added lifelike characteristics around the girl's eyes, mouth, and chin. Here is Hughes' clay-covered reconstruction. It was sent to Studio EIS, a sculpture and design studio that specializes in historically accurate sculptures. There, the first step was to create a plaster mold. So this is where they're creating the plaster mold, right here. The mold was filled with water-based clay to provide a pliable model that the artist could sculpt further, and they added details such as ears and eyelids and hair. The use of clay allowed the sculptors to continually refine these details until Owsley and Bruelheide gave their approval to create the final permanent reconstruction. The sculptors then created one more mold by applying a flexible, rubbery material called silicone to the sculpture, allowing it to dry and peeling it off the clay. The silicone mold was filled with plaster. After this plaster cast dried, an artist painted it to complete the facial reconstruction. The result is a lasting, durable sculpture, sculpture worthy of museum display. It's also the first such reconstruction of an American colonist of African ancestry. You can see right here, the result of these efforts is a lifelike reconstruction of HK7, the first of a colonist of African ancestry. So they took her actual skull and they used it to create this lifelike sculpture. This is beautiful. The creation of facial reconstructions perfectly illustrates how two seemingly different disciplines, science and art, can complement each other. The combination of Owsley and Bruelheide's scientific analysis and interpretation of a skull's bony features with the artistic talents of sculptors who specialize in forensic work gives us a rare opportunity. Despite the passage of centuries, we can come face to face with people who lived long ago, further strengthening the skeletal story that has already established a connection between us. A feeling that moves you. As more men and women streamed to the Chesapeake region from England and elsewhere, new cities were founded. Just as Jamestown was eventually replaced by a new capital and a better location for trade, St. Mary's City gave way to Annapolis. Slowly, people moved away. The city's buildings fell into disrepair. Their wood and stone were hauled away and used to construct new dwellings and shops and churches in other towns. As time passed, soil covered the old foundations and farmers planted their crops in the soil. St. Mary's City, like Jamestown, was forgotten, but not forever. Over the past 50 years, archaeologists and forensic anthropologists have studied the graves of more than 317th century Chesapeake colonists from many different sites in Virginia and Maryland. Their work is not finished. New technologies are being developed all the time. Today's young people will be the new generation of scientists who will examine colonial remains using better technologies than we have today. They will be the ones who answer the questions that we can't answer now, Owsley stated. Meanwhile, recently discovered buildings and graves at James Fort, St. Mary's City, and other colonial sites continue to provide information about America's past. Here we have archaeologists measuring and documenting the findings of two more graves inside St. Mary's Brick Chapel. The second grave lies directly beneath the first. Only the feet of the second burial are visible. So you can see here is a full skeleton. No matter how many graves scientists excavate, there will always be more information to discover about the Chesapeake's first European and African settlers. Studying one or two skeletons can provide information about a single individual, who they were physically and what they may have experienced, Carrie Bruelheide observed.
But studying many skeletons provides information about an entire group of people, a population. Their mortality, or death patterns, health, general activity patterns, and even cultural practices. Bruhlheide has found inspiration in the Czech chance to enhance the historical record with the discovery of physical evidence too. Skeletal remains provide us with the additional opportunity to document or confirm the historical record in a tangible way. For example, the struggle at Jamestown during the starving time, or an attack on James Fort as evidenced in the remains of JR 1225B, the boy with the arrowhead in his leg. The archaeological excavation of 17th and 18th century graves also gives us a new perspective on colonial customs. As Henry Miller noted, the entire subject of how 17th century Chesapeake colonists treated their dead is not recorded in the historical record. As a result of excavating the graves, we have new information about burial rituals, whether they used a shroud or a coffin, how the coffins were constructed, and the amount of care taken to bury a loved one. Such studies have helped scholars to better understand how traditions and customs from many places in England were maintained or blended together in America. There is a surprising diversity of coffin types used at St. Mary's City, some not seen before in America, Miller observed. We think this is because the Chesapeake colonists, unlike New England colonists, came from a variety of areas in England, and each area had distinctive ways of living. This is a powerful clue to enduring cultural connections that are not often expressed in written evidence. The field of medicine is enriched by forensic anthropology as well. Colonial remains provide insight into the causes of death and illness. For example, the colonists' teeth showed a much higher rate of decay after they began eating a corn-based diet compared to before. Corn is high in carbohydrates, substances that contain sugar, Owsley explained. It's also sticky, so it clings to the teeth. When corn became a main ingredient in the colonial diet, people got more cavities, which led to abscesses, which led to tooth loss. Forensic studies also show how the bones of populations of people respond to physical labor, disease, and harsh living conditions, all of which the Chesapeake settlers knew well. The discovery that many Chesapeake colonial children suffered from rickets surprised Owsley. Historians already knew that rickets were common in England during the last half of the 1800s, when the Industrial Revolution led to the widespread building of factories. In those days, factories pumped large amounts of coal pollution into the air, reducing the amount of sunlight that reached people's skin. The lack of sunlight, which provides vitamin D, caused a large number of English children to develop rickets. Let's go back to this picture. Here's the brick chapel in St. Mary's City where lead coffin people were found. It's being completely reconstructed and it will give people yet another way to experience the past. In contrast, the air in the Chesapeake during colonial times was unpolluted by manufacturing wastes. Ricketts seems oddly out of place. But when you take the cultural custom of swaddling into account, that explains it, Owsley observed. The tightly wrapped infants didn't receive adequate amounts of sunlight or vitamin D. As more information from colonial skeletons is gathered and examined, Owsley expects that additional discoveries about health and medicine will be made. As useful and fascinating as these discoveries are, the gathering of data is not the only goal that motivates these scientists. In the words of Carter Hudgens, excavating and researching recovered artifacts is one thing, but to come face to face with a person always has an impact. Not a scary feeling. It's a feeling that moves you. At Jamestown, for example, suddenly we can associate the place with the people and the hardships they faced. It puts our work into a larger perspective. This sense of meaning, the ability to find a new connection to the past, is a recurring theme for many who have devoted their careers to archaeology and forensic anthropology. We can shed some light on who these people were and how they lived and died, Bruelheide observed. This information lets us view history in terms we can intimately understand, at the human and individual level. In knowing better the story of these first immigrants, we might better understand how we got to where we are as a nation. Miller describes his work as a sort of tribute to the people whose remains he studies. The fact that we can learn from these colonists and gain a deeper understanding of them and their times is a way of giving them respect. Although their names are usually lost to time, we can still recognize their existence and honor their lives, he concluded. Owsley added, Most of these people lived their whole lives without anyone writing a word about them. 
the information we gather from their skeletons is, in essence, their legacy. Each time an archaeologist excavates a grave, we're given the opportunity to come face to face with a person who was once someone's son or daughter. And as each skeleton reveals its secrets, history takes on a new life. The bones of the Chesapeake colonists prove that they endured pain or endless toil or frequent illness. Some lived well and some did not. Some were buried well and some were not. From the basement grave at Levy Neck to the captain's honorable resting place with his leading staff, from the simple but respectful wooden coffins of Harley Knoll to the luxurious lead coffins of St. Mary's City, the graves and the remains of colonial settlers carry a message to the people of today. They remind us not to forget their lives and accomplishments and not to lose our connection to the past. A broken tooth, a fractured bone, an arthritic back, and strands of brown hair, all of them whisper, Rest with me for a moment or two. I have a story to tell. These tales, written only in bone, await those with the patience to find them. <laughs>